today. They're trying to make New England feel like Old England. Celebrate Thanksgiving like the Pilgrims. For we desired a special manner of rejoicing. With a healthy serving of lobster? Something not many of us put on our Thanksgiving tables today. We'll celebrate fact from fiction. They honored one another and became better friends. And bust the myths of Plymouth Rock. They ought to thank God for that. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. Well, it looks like Vladimir Putin is a poker player, and he pulled a bluff, and Turkey called him. And in the process, shot down one of their planes. He shouldn't have been messing around in the Turkish airspace anyhow. Uh, but is this going to be some kind of a face-off? I doubt it very much. If NATO will stay strong, and Turkey is a NATO ally, we vowed to defend them. So <clears throat> I know uh, uh, Putin has ordered state-of-the-art air defense missile systems to be deployed at a Russian air base in Syria. But uh, I think he's bluffing, and we need to call it. Wendy? Well, both countries say they don't want war. But if Russia shoots down a Turkish plane, that could mean more military showdowns that might even involve the United States. Chris Mitchell brings us the latest from that region. Turkey's President Erdogan said he didn't want to escalate the situation, but he needed to protect Turkey's security and defend their allies inside Syria. Russia's military defense condemned the attack and announced three steps it would take after the incident. It said bombing attacks would be escorted by fighter jets, air defenses would be increased, and military contacts with Turkey would be suspended. After the attack, Russia's President Vladimir Putin used exceptionally strong language. He called the incident a stab in the back, promised significant consequences to Turkey, and said Russia would not tolerate such atrocities. Russia's foreign minister canceled his upcoming trip to Turkey. Putin also accused Turkey of collusion with ISIS. We stated many times the fact that a large amount of oil and oil products is being transferred to the territory of Turkey from the territory seized by ISIS. That is how these gangsters are receiving their financial support. In Washington, U.S. President Barack Obama urged calm. Turkey, like every country, has a right to defend its territory and its airspace. Uh, I think it's very important right now for us to make sure that both the Russians and the Turks are talking to each other, find out exactly what happened. Turkey, a NATO member, asked NATO for an emergency meeting. It's the first time in 50 years a NATO plane shot down a Russian plane. It remains to be seen if NATO will invoke Article 5. It states an attack on one member is an attack on all. Turkey and Russia both produced evidence they said proved their version of events. Turkey said the Russian plane violated its airspace after 10 separate warnings. Russia said its plane was shot down over Syrian territory. After the plane was shot down, Syrian rebels produced this video showing them destroying one of the Russian helicopters sent to rescue the pilots. It appears the pilot died in the incident while the co-pilot has been rescued. Russia and Turkey have a long history of tense relations and the incident exposes two competing alliances seeking to dominate the region. Russia and Shiite Iran on one hand, and Sunni Turkey on the other. When Putin brought Russia into the Syrian civil war, retired U.S. General Jay Garner told CBN News he introduced a new danger to the region. In the air should be a big problem if, if he puts fighter aircraft in there and they begin to uh, they begin put in airstrikes against rebel forces while we're putting in airstrikes against Assad forces. How do you deconflict all that? And it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a tinderbox. For now, it remains to be seen if the spark from this incident will set the tinderbox in the region on fire. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. I think that Putin is a master post poker player. He's trying to bluff. He hasn't got much. His uh, economy is in shatters. Uh, and uh, if we would maintain the sanctions and step up uh, any kind of military buildup if we'd put some decent armament in for the Ukrainian rebels. And we'd also remember those people in the Baltics that are, you know, on the front line in regard to Russia. 
if we would let them know that we are with them. But we can't have this leading from behind stuff. The whole world is crying, crying for leadership, just crying for leadership. And uh, n nobody resents the United States being the leader. They're all asking for it. But do we have it? Well, it doesn't seem that way. Because despite the terrorist attacks uh, in Paris, President Obama doesn't have any new plans for taking on the brutal killers of ISIS. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau. Pat, nothing new. Rather, the president is promising the U.S. will offer more of the same in the fight against ISIS, even after French President Hollande's White House visit. And that, again, has some critics saying Mr. Obama isn't doing enough to defeat radical Islamists in Syria and Iraq. Jennifer Wishon brings us that story from the White House. As prosecutors learned, the man believed to be behind the terror attacks in Paris was planning another suicide bombing in the city. French President Francois Hollande lobbied President Obama at the White House for the military might only the U.S. can provide. It is about taking out their financing, hunting down their leaders, dismantling their networks, and taking back the land they currently control. This week, President Obama will sign legislation sustaining American support to France and the 65 nations working together to stop ISIS. He also wants the European Union to require airlines to share passenger information, a move designed to stop terrorists from entering countries undetected. Make no mistake, we will win and groups like ISIL will lose. But for many Americans, simply sustaining America's current fight isn't enough. The president is facing increased pressure to accelerate his efforts to destroy the Islamic State as a majority of Americans now fear a terrorist attack inside the U.S. is likely within a matter of months. Even if America were attacked, national security expert James Carafano says he's not sure the president would change his strategy. And power or lack thereof, he says, is the only thing ISIS understands. You have to look at it from ISIS' perspective. I mean, they live in a part of the world where honor equals power. You're, you're a powerful person, you're respected, not because you're a nice guy and pay your taxes, but because you have power and you're willing to use it. And, uh, and that really is the coin of the realm. In this war, Carafano says, the two enemies bring different perspectives of success. Obama says, you know, it's this kind of slow, contain, run them down kind of strategy. And the ISIS strategy is, well, as long as we're standing and the black flag is flying, we're winning. The president also faces growing concerns from Democrats about his push to let Syrian refugees into the country. He maintains that doing less is un-American. On the Statue of Liberty, a gift from the people of France, there are words we know so well. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. That's the spirit that makes us American. In a nation that knows what terror feels like, many Americans are eager to show France they care. President Obama is going to need to show the same kind of commitment um, and help that was provided to the United States by many countries after 9-11. We had that after 9-11, and we need to show it to other countries. That opportunity comes next week, when more than 120 world leaders will meet in Paris for a climate summit. Obama and Ulan agree attendance is the best possible response to the Islamic State's attacks. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, the White House. Thanks, Jennifer. A new FBI alert is urging caution as Americans plan to celebrate Thanksgiving, warning of the potential for copycat terror in the wake of the Paris and Mali attacks. And some people are facing another major roadblock in their travel plans, snow. Heather Sells has the story. More than 46 million Americans are expected to travel by car, plane, bus, or train this week, the most Thanksgiving travelers since 2007. But in the wake of terror attacks in Paris and around the world, the FBI has issued an alert warning of the potential for copycat terror here at home. The FBI warning involves beefing up security at softer targets like malls, trains and airports across the country. We have to go through the protocols because you never know. The, the bad guys only have to be right once. 
and that's something that we have to guard against constantly. Authorities have not identified any specific terror plot and don't believe that ISIS has sent a cell from Syria to the U.S. like it did in Paris. But many of the country's 18,000 law enforcement agencies are stepping up their security and the FBI is focusing on a group of ISIS followers here in the U.S. with suspects under 24-hour surveillance. For travelers out west this week, snow may prove more dangerous than any other threat. Heading up 80 is not, <laughs> not the safest drive, especially going over Donner Pass. It was a pain. <laughs> with the condition like this, it's hard. A storm in Northern California is bringing much needed snow to the drought starved region, but also causing all kinds of delays. The main problem spin outs on slick and icy roads, forcing many drivers to resort to chains and severely reduce their speed. Heather Sell, CBN News. Thank you, Heather. The Paris terror attacks ignited a worldwide debate over Syrian refugees stretching from Europe to America, where even some governors are trying to block them from entering their states. CBN's Operation Blessing is on the ground in war-torn Syria and brings us a voice missing from the debate. As Ephraim Graham reports, it's the voice of those fleeing for their lives. Refugees are front page news and the headlines only increased. Following reports, authorities found a Syrian passport near an assailant killed in the deadly Paris attacks. You know, we're hearing stories about ISIS infiltration and all that, and I think that's good that we're aware of these possible problems. Operation Blessing President Bill Horan recently witnessed the refugee crisis firsthand. He stood at the border of Hungary and Croatia, where thousands arrived having crossed nine borders to reach that point. You have been on the front lines now. What are we not hearing? What are we not, not seeing? We're certainly only seeing one side of the story. And the side of the story that I keep noticing that's being left out is the story from the perception of the refugees. The vast majority of these folks, at least the ones that we've interacted with, that we met, that we talked to while we were over there, uh, they're not terrorists at all. These are some of the faces. Photographs taken by Operation Blessings David Dark, who spent time talking to those whose images he captured. They said, we had three choices. We could either be conscripted into the Assad regime and fight for Assad, or we have to fight for ISIS, forced to fight for ISIS, or we can just stay here and be killed. So when we see these attacks happening in Paris and all this terror happening around the world, we need to understand that's the very terror that these people are running from, not running towards. There are many young men among those running, and it's no accident. That's a blessing Bill learned talking to a 27-year-old Syrian Christian whose family pooled their money to send him. He said, I went to the meeting. I did not volunteer to leave my home and come to Germany. I was chosen by the family as the one most likely to make it across nine borders, across a 17-hour ride in a rubber boat from Turkey to Greece. He said, I was seasick for 17 hours and I was sure I was going to die. He said, we were all praying out loud, praying to the Lord just to get us to the other side. He said, many people drowned on the way. So it's essentially desperation is where they're leaving. They're, they're fleeing. They're leaving out of desperation, of course. Still, not everyone is able to flee. That's why Operation Blessing isn't just stopping at the border. We're actually working inside Syria. We've got partners that are inside Syria, in the northeastern part of Syria, the area that is still uh, safe from ISIS, at least now, because the Kurds are defending that area. There are Syrians that are there, Christian Syrians that speak Aramaic, the language of Jesus. Ephraim Graham, CBN News. Thank you, Ephraim. Pat, so many stories of desperation and urgent need. The thing you got to remember is Operation Blessing was there, and this isn't part of the hype. The trouble is the hype now is you, you've got to be against refugees. And if you're not against refugees, somehow you're not a good Republican or you're not conservative or you don't like America or something. These people are hurting, and our guys were there with them. And the ones they talked to, these a lot of them are Christian. And uh, they just have to get out or get killed. I mean, that's what Bill Horan was saying. And he's there. He's there talking to them. And the, we, we're working now in northern Syria. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, what Operation Busting is doing, you're giving food, you've got plastic tarps you, to, to keep them warm, you've got clothing, you have other things that they desperately need. 
and uh, we're there for them. So uh, th that's what Operation Blessing does is to help people. But it does seem to me like there's so many Christians and so many people who love freedom in that group that they themselves could do some checking on which in that group are actually ISIS uh, sympathizers and supporters. And they could help uh, the authorities identify those people. Uh, but uh, really, they don't belong in America. That's not their destination. They should be resettled close in the Middle East where they have uh, the roots and where they've been for so many years. And there has to be some effort uh, to do that. But this is a humanitarian tragedy of massive proportion. And if you want to help, by the way, um, Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund and uh, we're there, folks. We're there on the scene where those people are and where they're hurting. So all you've got to do, pick up your phone or log in uh, on the Internet, and uh, there's the number and there's the address. But uh, we're not going to let those people starve. We've got to do something to help them. You know, it well, sure does put a different well, face on the refugee crisis when you see that story. Well, they, they've talked to I me. Mean, Bill yeah. talks to these people. They've actually interviewed them. They, they know the, the heart and the people. Yeah. They're just crying out. We had to flee. And that one young man said, out of his family, uh, they took up a, 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 an offering. And it has cost, I mean, those traffickers are charging uh, nine, ten, eleven, twelve thousand dollars to get them across the water. And uh, the, 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 the reason so many young men are coming is because their families say, you're the only ones that can survive this ordeal to right. get to the other side. Yeah, that's a story we haven't heard. Thanks, Pat. Hello, amen. Well, up next, facts about the first Thanksgiving that may surprise you. Most likely there was fish on the first uh, Thanksgiving table, as we now refer to it. Possibly lobsters. Lobster for Thanksgiving. Hmm. Stay tuned for more fun facts when we come back. <laughs> well, one day away from Turkey Day, the Thanksgiving, you know, uh, our president uh, has given a Thanksgiving proclamation that we would give thanks to Almighty God. And uh, President Roosevelt particularly gave a very moving uh, message, especially when we were facing the terror of World War II, uh, that we would give thanks. And as a nation, we're supposed to pause and give thanks. I know now there's an orgy of they've, they've pushed Christmas back past Thanksgiving. And so they're going to open all the stores, and they've got what they call Black Friday, and then everybody's, you know, running to get these bargains. But let's keep in mind that we do have Thanksgiving, and the reason is to give thanks to God for His many blessings. And don't forget it. Mm. Well, many Americans think they know what happened at that first Thanksgiving. They picture pilgrims wearing big buckles and feasting on fat, turkeys. But what really happened is actually quite different. Paul Strand actually went to Plymouth, Massachusetts, so she can bring you the actual facts. And uh, of course, I'd like to tell you that I was there with John Alden and Priscilla, but uh, I wasn't. <laughs> the Pilgrim's first days and first feast in America are shrouded in conjecture and folklore, like the most famous object associated with their landing at Plymouth, Massachusetts. Right inside that structure is the famous Plymouth Rock. Though many folks doubt there actually was a rock, and if there was, that it was exactly there. <laughs> but we do know the Pilgrims started building a small village like this faithful recreation of Plymouth Plantation, even as the harsh winter of 1620 was killing half their number. And only had 51 of 102 people left at the end of that season. Leo Martin and his wife Nancy not only run the faith-based Jenny Museum in Plymouth, but also serve as Pilgrim role players. Martin says the survivors of that winter went on to plant crops that grew well enough they knew they wouldn't starve. So it was time for Thanksgiving. They developed enough food to make it through the next winter, and they thought that they ought to thank God for that. For we desired a special manner of rejoicing, the Lord having sustained us for a year and brought in such a goodly harvest. One of the only two pilgrims to write of that first Thanksgiving was Edward Winslow. His words about the preparations brought alive for CBN News by a Plymouth Plantation interpreter very first feast that we had in these parts, our governor sent four men on fowling. And in just some small hours, them four men were able to take enough wild fowl to feed our company for a week. 
In Plymouth's annual Thanksgiving parade, they envision the giant plump turkeys modern folks imagine the pilgrims dined upon. Actually, their turkeys were wild, lean, and mean. I find that the turkeys here of New England, they are a bit different than those that lived on the dung hills back home into England, but they are a toothsome bird. Another sure fact, these grateful Englishmen didn't dine alone, because they knew they wouldn't have made it without the Indians, or sechems as Winslow called them. Not only did the Native Americans have to show them what could grow in this radically different soil, they had to teach these city dwellers from the old world how to hunt and how to fish in this new world. They felt that Massasoit, the chief of the Wampanoag Indians, uh, was so instrumental in their survival that they should invite Massasoit and his immediate family to that celebration, and they did. But Massasoit misunderstood a bit. While we were feasting and making of sports and exercising our arms, amongst us come the great Sachem Massasoit and about 90 of his men. Martin points out that could have wiped out all the pilgrim supplies, but the chief and his braves brought plenty of food with them. Venison, turkey, fish, vegetables, and together they had enough food for a three-day celebration where they honored one another and became better friends. Nora Messier, Plymouth Plantation's food expert. Most likely there was fish on the first uh, Thanksgiving table, as we now refer to it, possibly lobsters. We know that when the natives arrived, they brought with them venison, something not many of us put on our Thanksgiving tables today. We'd put pumpkin pie on our tables. Messier showed CBN News what the pilgrims would have done instead. One of the things that, of course, most people would say you can't have Thanksgiving without your pumpkin pie. What I'm going to be doing here is exactly what we know they did frequently in New England. The ancient standing dish is called stewed pompion. Pompion is the period term for the pumpkin. The pilgrims would dice it and stew it into sort of a mush. Eventually, you're going to add just a splash of vinegar and a little bit of ginger and supposedly it's going to taste like stewed apples, something that was definitely not on the first Thanksgiving table. No apples in New England. They were huge on stuffing, but it took a lot more labor. Raisins up until recently had seeds in them still. Imagine picking out all of those seeds. And they'd season it with herbs brought all the way from England, like thyme, hyssop, and parsley. We believe that the things they're growing in their kitchen gardens in the 17th century are primarily things that had been brought over from England. They're trying to bring home with them. They're trying to make New England feel like old England. Which is maybe why a fellow like Winslow would have preferred something better than those skinny New England turkeys. In truth, my greatest delight is a goose, for I do love it. its great fatness. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Plymouth, Massachusetts. How about that? Now, that's the way it was. Have you ever eaten a wild turkey? I haven't. They are skinny rascals, and they can't, I mean, the butter balls that we get in the, in the grocery store is a totally different bird from what runs wild. It has a taste. Well, it doesn't taste bad, but it is is—it is lean. I mean, it doesn't yeah. have the fat, and it doesn't have that, that big, butter thick ball flavor. Yeah. yeah. And, and, so it's it's more you use the term gamey. It's a stronger meat. Probably healthier for you. Maybe. Yeah, a lot healthier, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, we'll stick with our butter balls. Right? You know, up in the mountains of Virginia, I, I, I've seen a number of turkeys, and when they take off, boy, they make so much noise. You're walking <laughs> along, all of a sudden, brrr, you know, they explode, and it's they're pretty, beautiful creatures. Yeah, to but see they in the they wild. have they have whole. Uh, yeah. What do you call it? It's not flock. Uh, they've got a term for it that I'm. I, it escapes me right now, but uh, um, you know the little little turkeys are called shoats, and um, so you can see a whole family of them yeah. across the road and going around up there. So beautiful. They're, they're they're beautiful things. Yeah. Well, have a happy Thanksgiving. Amen <laughs> for everybody. Well, coming up, we'll bring it on. Michael says my soccer coach and teammates make ungodly jokes conversation and listen to ungodly music. Sometimes I find myself doing the things they are doing. Should I quit the team? Stay tuned for Pat's answer right after this. Welcome back to the 700 Club. We've got Pat in the hot seat and we've got your questions. Let's get started. Michael says, I am on the soccer team and my teammates and coaches do not follow God. I have shared the gospel of Jesus, but most of them show no interest. They make ungodly jokes, conversation, and also listen to ungodly songs. I'm surrounded by these things every time we're together during practices and games. And sometimes I find myself doing the things they're doing. What do I do? Should I leave the team? 
Uh, you know, the Apostle Paul dealt with that, and it's in the Bible. He says, look, uh, if I should not consort with people who are fornicators or thieves, I, I needn't be leave the world. But he said, don't get involved with people who claim to be brothers who do that. Right. And so within the church, we're not supposed to have that kind of conduct, but you're going to run into people who uh, uh, use, tell dirty jokes, and who watch porn, and who uh, do nasty things, and that's part of the world. And Paul said, I'd have to leave the world if I were not going to have some relationship with them. Uh, I, I, the, the question is, if, if the coach is trying to impose that type of conduct on you and make you do that, make you use that kind of language, and I'd get out of there in a heartbeat. But uh, hey, that's usual camaraderie in the sports arena, trust me. I mean, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And so if you want sports, that's, you, you're going to have that kind of conduct. All right. All right. Well, Deb writes in, what possibility do you see that our country would be in so much chaos from ISIS attacks that President Obama could declare martial law, suspend the Constitution, and remain in the office of the president at the time of the presidential election? You know, I've read that stuff. I think that's fanciful nonsense. I, I just, uh, uh, we, we still have a pretty strong, robust nation, and I just don't think the idea of uh, some palace coup by the president to extend elections is going to take place. But the coup that the man is doing is federal regulations. I understand the last few days there was 2,000 regulations. The EPA was given another mandate to go after all kinds of coal companies and power companies. Mm -hmm. So that's what Obama wants to do before he leaves, is to saddle this country with unbearable regulation so he would fulfill his socialist agenda. Well, wow. he says the climate change conference that, uh, in Paris yeah. next week is, is the way to fight ISIS, Pat. <laughs> yeah, that's it. We, we're going <laughs> to, you know, cool the planet down. All right. Francis writes in, I don't understand about the second judgment. Do you go straight to heaven or to hell when you die? And what is the second judgment compared to the first? Well, um, I think the, as I understand it, this is called the white, great white throne. And uh, Jesus said, you read uh, John 5, 24, it says, he that uh, believes in me and, and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into the judgment, but is passed from death into life. Now, when we know the Lord, our sins are forgiven <clears throat> and we do not go into that final great white throne judgment. But the nations of the world, the ones who don't know him, are going to have to give account for the actions that they have committed during this time on earth. And they will stand before the Lord, the judge of all the earth, and the books will be open, and it's going to be a terrible scene. All right. All right. Sean says, about 20 years ago, I was wrongfully accused of, kill of killing a dog. This came from a Christian family I'm close to. I thought the matter had been cleared up, yet recently the father of the family brought it up and talked about how I killed the dog. I simply said to him politely, I didn't kill any dog, and that was, and the matter was dropped. Yet now I feel this family still believes I had something to do with the dog's death. Should I speak with the family or let it go? I don't want to lose their friendship, yet I also don't want to be considered a dog killer. Uh, you didn't kill the dog. You said you didn't kill the dog, so get on with your life. Yeah, what are you going to do, sue him? I mean, you know, just forget it. Uh, I, you know, I, you've already told him you didn't do it, and that's it. So your conscience is clear, and, and get on with your life. Amen. Some people uh, are just troublemakers. They just want to dig stuff yeah. up. Okay. <laughs> right. All right. Patrick says, my wife and I are really getting deeper into the Word and, and have noticed that many translations are available to read. What is your favorite translation to read and study? I'd like to know that as well. Um, I, I, I use this new international thing. It's called the NIV. Uh, there were a group of scholars, and I think the book is published by Zonabrin, but they were very strong Bible-believing Christians who who were deeply, uh, you know, immersed in the in the Word, and who had uh, extraordinary scholarship. And I think the NIV is probably as good as there is. I used to like the New American Standard, which is very true to the Greek, but it's just a little jerky. But the NIV reads well, and mm. and I think it's one that you can trust. The, 
Of course, the majesty of the King James is always there. It's a lot easier to remember, but some of it just isn't as true to, to the more recent f Greek manuscripts that have been found. That, that's why I like the New King James, because it still has some of that beautiful language, it's but it's much easier to understand. But it still doesn't take advantage of... We have discovered manuscripts as we have done archaeological research. We, I mean, the, the church and the you know, society over the years, and we have fragments that have come out, and we have writings of Irenaeus and others uh, that g give uh, understanding of, uh, of, of the Greek. And, you know, I, one of the best courses I had in seminary was called Textual Criticism, where you, you can get a couple of texts in Greek, and um, you can almost begin to understand which one you translate. Hmm. But there are choices that translators have. The King James comes out of the Textus Receptus that was put together by uh, uh, Erasmus, and that's that's where it comes from. So, but NIV is the well, one you like. I, I believe it's it's a superb translation. All right, I'm going to try. Well, that. during the recession, many small businesses struggled to stay afloat, and others closed their doors. But Joel and Lisa figured out how to keep their company going strong in any economy. Watch this. Joel Smith has been in the towing business for years. He and his brother Steve run Fountain City Wrecker, a company their father started in 1945. Joel gives God the credit for their longevity and success. Uh, it probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God. God's always took care of us. He and his wife Lisa believe it goes back to a decision they made as newlyweds almost 40 years ago that for rich or for poor, they would tithe to their church. I've had times where, you know, maybe we couldn't exactly afford to tithe, but, you know, you give your tithe and uh, you'll be blessed for it. Yes, we've seen God uh, always meet our needs, always. It's never failed us. Even through the ups and downs of the economy, they say God sustained the business because they were faithful to give. About anything that can happen in this business, we've experienced it. But we was well blessed where God, uh, he'll, he'll give it back to you if you give it to someone or give them either your services or a break on the charges. As the company grew, the Smiths started giving above their tithe to other ministries. In 1977, they became CBN partners. I was a young mother at home and I had the TV on and um, Pat Robertson was on with the 700 Club and he explained about partnering with him. They've been giving to CBN ever since. I just want to help others. I want to be a part of broadcasting to the world about Jesus. Their towing company has grown over the years from just a few trucks to over 20 with 13 employees. If you feel like that you've given something to someone in need, you'll, get, you'll make it back before you turn the next corner. There's a universal principle that he put into existence, and it's reap what you sow, and give, and it shall be given unto you. Well, I love people like that who really love God and who love the Word and, and are obedient to it. And God says, I love you, and I'm going to bless you. And uh, it's what He said, you know, prove me with tithes and offerings. I want to open the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing you can't contain it. Well, here's a blessing. He's called the transforming Word. Verses to overcome fear and experience peace. We'll send this to you if you join the 700 Club, 65 cents a day. And um, starting at the first of the year, uh, they, they had me get together uh, with uh, Terry, and we were talking about heaven and what heaven's like and uh, what you can know about heaven. And we had some people who'd been to heaven. I had a noted cardiologist talking about heaven. And that's going to be the premium we're going to offer next year. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, fantastic. But this is peace. You can listen to the Word, and we'll give this to you. It's a DVD or a CD. And, um, I've got it in my car. I've got it does ready it, to Does go. it bless you? you it it does, because, you know, not only driving can be stressful, but people are afraid right now. There's so much going on yeah, in the news, yeah. and if you listen to too much news, you can just get, you know, and you put that on, and you have nice soothing peace. voice and you hear these scriptures about overcoming fear and about the peace of God and before you know it you're like I'm not afraid of anything <laughs> I can do anything <laughs> fear not <laughs>
<laughs> All right. It's Exhibit A. So 65 cents a day. Call and join the 700 Club. And by the way, they tell me we've got something coming up next Tuesday, December 1. It's called Give Back. Uh, to Give Back Tuesday. And uh, dollar for dollar, as part of Give Back Tuesday, the campaign, this is your opportunity to give back as a way to say uh, thanks for all the many blessings that you have. So uh, I understand some partners will match what you give during that special day. So there's a number available, same number, or you can log on and find out about Give Back Tuesday. Wendy. All right. Well, still ahead, it's a Christmas tradition more than a thousand years old, and it starts next Sunday. Discover the symbolism behind the Advent wreath and how you and your family can celebrate this season. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. ISIS has released 10 more Assyrian Christian hostages. The Assyrian Network for Human Rights says they were released Tuesday and are all in good condition. The 10 were part of more than 220 Assyrian Christians captured by ISIS after it overran communities in northeastern Syria last February. The group also says the release was the result of ongoing efforts by the head of the Assyrian Church of the East in Syria. So far, 98 Assyrian Christian hostages have been released. Well, a newborn baby is the center of a mystery at a Christmas nativity scene in New York City. Police are trying to find out who left the newborn at a church nativity in Queens. The baby, with its umbilical cord still attached, was found lying in the manger wrapped in towels at the Holy Child of Jesus Church. New York law allows for newborns to be dropped off at churches, hospitals, or police and fire stations, but requires the child to be left with someone or for authorities to be immediately notified. Police say the baby's at a local hospital and in good condition. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Introducing CBN Selah, a brand new Christian instrumental station from CBN Radio. Listen now at CBNRadio.com. For many people, the period between Thanksgiving and Christmas is all about shopping, cooking, eating, and decorating. Well, for Christians, it's also the time known as Advent. And Pat's daughter-in-law, Lisa Robertson, joined Terry in our studio to talk about the significance of this season and to show us how to make the centerpiece that's at the heart of it, the Advent wreath. Take a look. Well, Christmas is almost upon us. And if your home is like mine, I'm always thinking of ways to make the season really meaningful. And my friend Lisa Robertson is joining me right now because we want to talk with you about Advent, an age-old tradition, but one that still has meaning to a family today. Share a little bit, Lisa, about what Advent is. Advent is the season in the church calendar that begins four weeks before Christmas. And it's a time of preparation, and it's a time of talking about the coming of Christ as an infant in the manger, and also when he comes again in the second coming in glory. Mm -hmm. So it's all about coming towards this is a very significant event in your home. I've known you for many years, and I know that your family celebrates this each day of the four weeks before Christmas. And there's a sense of anticipation that right. comes with this in a family. One of the things I love about Advent is I feel like it's God's gift to us because it is a time where we can pause, we can reflect, mm -hmm. we can really begin to think about what Christmas really is. It's, yeah. a, it's a lot more than the chaos that we've come to expect. And we put the wreath on our kitchen table where we go through the devotional. We light one candle the first week, two candles the second week, and we really learn about you what Advent is. through the mm -hmm. whole process. But before we go to the candles, let's talk a little bit about what this means, because this isn't just a pretty wreath that you set on your table. Right. There's symbol to all of right, this. Right, there is. It's all very significant. The wreath is round because it symbolizes eternal life, and we reflect on that's the life that we have in Christ. It's green because that also is an image of eternal life, and then we have holly berries in it because the red berries indicate and remind us of the drops of blood that Christ shed for us. The other thing is the wreath is also in the shape almost of a crown, ah, like the yes. crown of thorns. Mm -hmm. Now, this is beautiful and magnificent. Some of this is alive, and you got it out of your yard, which people can be very creative doing, and some of it you've added on to with yes. 
You can add anything. Some years I have hydrangeas, some years I don't. It depends on what's growing in my garden and how it looks. Well, it looks beautiful today, I'll say that, but I want you to know the significance of this isn't the size or the beauty of the wreath. No. It's the message behind it, and that really begins to come our way through the lighting of the candles each week. Mm -hmm. Talk about the color of the candles and what that means. Well, the color purple is the main uh, Advent color, and the first thing that's important about it is it represents the royalty of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, purple is a royal color. Another reason it's important is that purple is also the color of repentance. And so in the Advent season, one of the things that's important is not only just to celebrate Christmas and to prepare our hearts, but to really think about the things in our to lives. Reflect. That, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To reflect and to really ask the Lord to just help us become more who He wants us to be. The third reason purple's uh, important is because one of the symbols of Advent is light. And right before the sun comes up, you'll have a purple sky, and it's a proclamation yes. of the sun that is just about yeah. to rise. And I think that's very significant. The purple would be just proclaiming Christ coming. The no, pink, you've got a pink is one. the, uh, they, some people call it the Mary candle. It can be called joy. There's a passage in the Bible that talks about Jesus being the Rose of Sharon. Mm -hmm. And so pink has several different meanings. And then the white candle is the last one you light and that represents the purity of Christ. So you you say this is the last one that mm -hmm. you light. So each of these you begin where? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you begin the with four weeks out. The, the four first weeks one. before Christmas you begin with a purple candle. And what we would do at our house is I would put a wreath on the table and we would sit down at dinner time and we would light one purple candle for the entire week. The first week we talk about the prophecies. There are four, over 400 prophecies in the Old Testament proclaiming the coming of Christ. And so we would just prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ, learn about the prophecies of Christ. The second week, we would light two purple candles and light two candles for the entire second week. And then we would read about the hope mm -hmm. that is in Christ. The third week, we would light the pink candle, the joy candle. Mm -hmm. And we talk about the joy of the Lord is our strength and the joy that Christ brings us. And then the fourth week, Again, we light the last fourth candle and we talk about worship and learn about one of the things I think is important about worship is we think of worship as something you do in church. Mm -hmm. You know, you worship and then you hear the message. And I think that worship is a way we should live. Yes. And we learn about just worshiping the Lord in just very simple and intimate ways. So then on Christmas morning, you would light all, all of, of these them. and... The Christ candle, the but Christ we really light the Christ candle oftentimes on Christmas, Christmas Eve, Eve, unless we're too busy, and then we light it on Christmas morning. Mm -hmm. And by then, you have a, a wreath that is filled with light, yes. and I think that that's representative of just yeah. the light of Christ that comes into the world. Now, this actually becomes a pause in your day, yes. a moment of family spent together, yes. focused on what the season is all about. You've put together a great little Advent book that has actually daily devotions that people can follow each right. day, so you don't even have to think up this stuff so Lisa's done the work for you 60 and, seconds yeah. or less <laughs> and it's also got uh, some advice here on how you can put a simpler wreath together if you'd like and this wreath can be of your Anything. own creation mm -hmm. or whatever you want it to be but what's really important is the family time spent together focusing on Christmas the Christmas message and anticipating celebrating the coming of Christ Lisa thank you I thank love you. the message this brings the thank message you. of hope and celebration for the Merry holidays. Christmas <laughs> Thank you, and to you too, and to you. We'll be back with more after this. Well, Christmas is only four weeks away, and have I got a great gift idea for you. Now your child can recreate the Superbook Adventure stories with the Superbook toys you just saw. Collect all eight characters, including David, Goliath, and yes, even Retro Gizmo. Each toy is 69 six, $6.99, sorry, each toy is just $6.99, and you can save 20% by getting all eight for just $44.49. And we'll throw in two bonus DVDs when you get the whole set. So just call the number on your screen, 1-800-579-4921. That's 1-800-579-4921, or you can log on to cbn.com slash Superbook Store. And, you know, I don't know what it is, Pat, about these little... Mm -hmm figurines yeah. but the little boys they just love they them they love them and to, to have real real uh characters that they can have battles and they can slay the mm -hmm. giant and 
they can tear down the walls of Jericho. They, we, it'll be fun. So anyhow, that's nice. I have a five-year-old nephew in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia, and he's crazy about Star Wars. And he also likes Superbook, but he would he would go nuts. So I hope he's not okay. watching so he doesn't well, I hope know he I'm going to get those. Them. Okay. <laughs> well, David Blanchard and his wife took a snow skiing vacation to Whistler, Canada to celebrate their 30th anniversary. Okay. Well, David is a macho guy, see? <laughs> so he looked at the ski jumps, and he thought, well, why not? <laughs> and then he took off on his skis and lived to regret it. We're at Whistler Mountain uh, on the ski slopes there, and I decided I want to hit this jump. And I hit the jump, and I was going pretty fast, actually too fast. So I hit the snow and knocked the wind right out of me. But on the way, when I came down, I planted this pole and it threw my shoulder, my left shoulder back, which tore my muscles and rotator cuff and everything, and I was in pain. The x-rays showed that the, that part of the rotator cuff had been damaged. I was frustrated more than anything else. It really frustrated me because I wasn't able to do the things that I always have done. So it had been three months since um, the accident. My wife and I uh, always watch the 700 Club and Gordon comes on with a word of knowledge and says, there's somebody there that has a shoulder injury. There's someone, you heard the report about uh, the shoulder being healed and you're saying, please say left shoulder. And so your, your, your prayer has been answered. Left shoulder be healed now. What you couldn't do before, do it now. Begin moving that shoulder and realize all that pain's gone and, and God's able to restore it. He's even able to restore any kind of tear. When he said, the Lord is healing you, and I said, I receive it in Jesus' name. And so that's when things started to happen. The next day I woke up and it was a, it was a little bit better. I could raise my arm up a little higher. I started realizing every day I was just doing things and I noticed that I was able to lift my hands up. I'm raising my arms up, I'm praising God during worship and I figured if I could do this and I could lift boxes and I could move things, I was healed. For God to take time to touch me and to bring healing to my shoulder is an incredible, incredible thing. He cares for us. God cares for us. He cares for you. Now, here's uh, somebody, Gwendolyn. She lives in Toronto, Ontario, had a mammogram. Her doctor called with the results, and there was a dark mass. He wanted more detail to determine the depth of it. She called the 700 Club for prayer. Then she went for a second mammogram, and guess what? The mass had dissolved, it vanished. Praise the Lord. Well, okay. listen to this. Yolanda from Round Rock, Texas. She has a 15-year-old daughter. Her daughter had an MRI to confirm that she had bleeding on the left side of her brain. The doctors were unsure as to the cause of the bleeding. Yolanda called the 700 Club for prayer, and when her daughter had a follow-up MRI, it showed that the bleeding had stopped. Both mom and daughter are praising God and giving him the glory. Amen. We're going to join hands right now. We've just got a minute and a half. We're going to pray. Yes, God. Father, Thank you, I Jesus. join with Wendy, and we pray for people in this audience that are suffering. As we come into this Thanksgiving time, a time for giving thanks, we give thanks to you. And right now, the people are suffering. They're in hospital beds yes. <clears throat> watching this program right now. <clears throat> Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus name. touch. Yes. When do you have something? What do you yeah, have? Yeah, there's a lady in, uh, I think it's a really bad oh, migraine. You just feel bad all over, and you're on the couch, and you're like, God, I've got to get up and start the Thanksgiving preparations, and the Lord's hearing your cry, and He's touching you Amen. right now. Receive your healing. Let the peace of God come upon all of you right yes, now. Jesus. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, today's Power Minute is from Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Tomorrow, celebrate Thanksgiving with the 700 Club. We'll meet the hero of Plymouth Rock and take a behind-the-scene tour of the Macy's Parade. 
see you then.